this video, we're going to introduce our final sets of trigonometric identities. So specifically the double angle identities, the power reducing identities, which are related to the double angle identities, and the half angle identities. <clears throat> so just as we have formulas that are going to allow us to find trig values for angles that are the sum or the difference of other angles, in other words, the sum and difference formulas, the ones we looked at in the last video, we also have formulas that allow us to find values for angles that are multiples, specifically doubles, so multiples, or fractions, specifically halves of other angles. So again, if we could write an angle as either double another angle or half of another angle that we know something about, then we can use this additional set of formulas to derive some additional trigonometric values. Now we use our double angle and our half angle formulas in different situations. We'll look at the power reducing ones at the end of the video. So half angle identities can be used in two cases. Number one, you can use them when angles are known. In other words, you're looking at angles on the unit circle and also when angles are unknown. So maybe you're given trigonometric information about an angle, maybe you're given it sine or cosine, and you want to find information from there. Double angle identities are only going to be used when angles are unknown. Why is that? Well, if you take an angle on the unit circle and double it, it turns out that you'll get another angle that's already been labeled on the unit circle. So double angle identities are not going to be helpful um, from the standpoint of using the unit circle and using angles we know from the unit circle. So we're only going to use them in situations when we have an unknown angle, we have information about it, and we want to find information about that angle when it's been doubled. So here are our half angle identities and then our double angle identities. So let's look at the half angles first. So if we were to take the sine of some angle that's been divided in half, it's going to be plus or minus, we'll talk about that in a minute, plus or minus the square root of one minus the cosine of the angle that you cut in half, all of that divided by two. Now for the cosine of an angle that's been divided in half, again, plus or minus, and then it's the same terms under the radical, but we've changed to addition. So with sine, it's gonna be subtraction under the radical. Cosine, it's gonna be addition under the radical. Now tangent, we also have a more complicated formula that involves a radical similar to the sine and cosine formulas, but we also have two alternate forms of the tangent formula that don't involve radicals. And so from a practical standpoint, we're typically just gonna use one of those forms um, if we want to evaluate the tangent of an angle when we've cut it in half. Now, what about this plus or minus stuff? This is unique here. This is unique to half angle identities you have to determine the sign of your output based on the quadrant that your half angle is in. So if you take an angle and cut it in half, determine what quadrant that's gonna be in. Based on that quadrant, is your sine positive, is your sine negative? You have to make that determination. Is your cosine positive, is your cosine negative? You have to make that determination. Why do these even exist right here? Well, think about what happens when you take a square root. In general, when you evaluate a square root, you're gonna get a positive output, right? But we know that the sine, the cosine, the tangent, they can be positive and they can be negative, depending on what part of the coordinate plane we're in. So if we only evaluate this square root, we're only going to get positive values for our sine, our cosine, and our tangent which means we may not get the negative values that we need depending on what quadrants of the unit circle, what quadrants of the coordinate plane we're looking at. So the plus or minus determination we have to make ourselves based on the quadrant we know we're gonna be in and then the associated signs for our trigonometric functions in that quadrant. So we'll talk about that a little bit more once we get to an actual example. Now our double angle identities if we were to take the sine of some angle, theta, that's been doubled, so think of this, all of this is the input for our sine. We've taken an angle, 
and we've doubled it. That's going to be two times the sine of the original angle times the cosine of the original angle. Now cosine of a double angle, two times some angle, we actually have three forms for that formula. The fundamental form is going to be cosine squared minus sine squared. Now where do these other two come from? They come from what would happen if you were to take one of these squared functions and substitute into that using, the, um, using some form of one of the Pythagorean identities. So if you were to replace cosine squared with one minus sine squared and then simplify all of this down, this would be the version of the formula you'd get. If instead you were to substitute one minus cosine squared in place of sine squared, well this would be the formula you would get down to. So as long as you know the first form, you can derive the other two forms just by substituting in place of one of these functions using um, a Pythagorean identity. And then our tangent of two theta is gonna be two tangent theta divided by one minus the tangent squared of theta. You're gonna find that there's typically a shortcut for evaluating tangent of two theta. Specifically, if you already know the value for the sine and the value for the cosine of that same double angle, you can just take the ratio of those two values because we know that sine divided by cosine is always gonna give us tangent. In most situations, it's gonna be faster to calculate your tangent that way than it is to directly use your tangent double angle formula. So let's just work through some examples, how we use these angles in different scenarios. So first example, we want to use a half angle formula to find the exact value of each expression. So the first expression is gonna be the sine of 157.5 degrees. Now we definitely haven't labeled anything on the unit circle that has a fraction of a degree. So automatically this tells me I need a formula in order to evaluate the sine of this angle. So first off, let's see what the approximate value is for this. So we are talking about an angle that's in the second quadrant. We know the sine is positive there. Now let's make sure we're in degree mode in the calculator. So if you're in radian mode, make sure you change it over. And we have the sine of 157.5 degrees. Sure enough, it is a positive number. Okay, so whatever we get as our final answer should have this same approximation. Now, how does a half angle formula work? Well, if we can take 157.5 degrees, we're not dividing it in half. Let's be clear on that. What happens if we take 157.5 and divide it in half? Well, we get an even more complicated angle that has an even worse decimal attached to it. The idea is that we want to take this angle, this angle that we don't know anything about, and if we can relate it to an angle that we know by the fact that it's half of that angle, then we can use what we know about the given angle to find information about this angle that we don't know anything about. So 157.5 is half of what angle? That's the question we wanna answer. 157.5 degrees is going to be half of what angle? What angle could we find on the unit circle that we could then divide in half to give us this angle that we're trying to find the sine of. Well, if we want to solve this relationship, move the two over, multiply by two. So our unknown angle that we're gonna need is gonna be 157.5 times two, which is gonna be 315 degrees. So you'll notice 315 degrees, that's one of the angles that we do have labeled on the unit circle. Because we know the coordinates at 315 degrees, we know the sine, we know the cosine, we can find any trig value we want. Well, we don't know anything about 157.5, but because we know things about 315, and we know that this is half of 315 degrees, we can use the fact that this is the same thing as the sine of 315 degrees divided in half, and then we can use the half angle identity in order to evaluate this sine value. So the half angle identity tells me 
use the angle I know something about. In this case, it's going to be 315 degrees. And we're going to take its cosine. Notice we only need one trig value for this 315, for the angle that we're cutting in half to give us that 157.5. It's going to be 1 minus the cosine of that angle, divide it by 2, and then take the square root. And then again, we'll worry about the plus minus in just a minute. I just want to plug directly into the formula, then we'll talk about the plus minus. So plus or minus square root of 1 minus the cosine of 315 degrees divided by 2. Whatever that is, whatever that comes out to, that should be the sine of 157.5 degrees. Now let's deal with the plus minus now, that way we don't forget about it. So 157.5 degrees, we decided that's in quadrant 2. Well, what do we know about quadrant two? We know that the x values are negative, the y values are positive. Which value does sine correspond to? Well, we know the sine corresponds to the y value. And in quadrant two, our y values are all going to be positive, which means the sine of 157.5 degrees is going to be positive, which means we want the positive version of this value, not the negative. If it had been in another quadrant and it had, had the same expression related here, but say it had been in a quadrant where sine is negative, well, we would keep the negative version of this value in order to account for the quadrant and the associated sign in that quadrant. So now that we know it's going to be positive, it's just a matter of simplifying all of this, plugging in the value for cosine of 315 and then going from there. So we have the square root of 1 minus the cosine of 315 degrees. Okay, well 315, that's in the fourth quadrant. We know the cosine, the x value, is going to be positive. 315 degrees, that's halfway around the quadrant. So that's going to be root 2 over 2. And then all of that is divided by 2. Now, how do we simplify this? Again, we have a fraction inside of a fraction, and then all of that is under a radical. So there's quite a bit going on here. This is a fairly complicated expression. One technique we can use anytime we want to get rid of a fraction inside of a fraction is identify the least common denominator for all of the internal fractions, the ones inside of the larger expression, and then multiply in the numerator and denominator by whatever that least common denominator is. So here we only have one fraction inside of the bigger fraction. Notice it has a denominator of two. So I'm gonna multiply in the numerator and denominator under the radical, focusing just on that fraction, under the radical, I'm gonna to multiply top and bottom by two. So in the numerator we have one minus root two over two, in the denominator we have our two, and we're multiplying on top and bottom by two. And all of that, all of that is under the radical. Now why can we do that? Again, multiplying by something divided by itself is just multiplying by one in a funny looking kind of way. I'm gonna put parentheses here in the numerator because remember we have to distribute that two to both terms. So when we distribute the two into that one, two times one is gonna be two, when I distribute the two to this second ratio, think of this as a two over one, just this two. Think of it as a two over one. So root two over two multiplied by two over one. Well, those common twos divide out, which just leaves me with the square root. So minus root two. And then notice that fraction is gone. In our denominator, two times two, that's gonna give us four. So we're not quite there, but we're a lot closer. This is a lot better than it was. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to keep going. So I have a ratio. I have a quotient inside of a radical. So one of the rules for radicals says that if you have a quotient inside of a radical, you can split it up into a quotient of radicals. Think of it kind of like distributing the square root so that it applies to the numerator and denominator separately. So if I apply it to the numerator, that's going to be the square root of 
2 minus root 2, which looks awful, but it, it is what it is. That's as simple as it's going to get. And then I can distribute it to the 4 in the denominator. Now, how does that benefit me? Well, again, I can't do anything with the numerator. A radical inside of a radical, it looks awful. It is what it is. But in the denominator, root 4, we can simplify that down so that it, it is rational. So the square root of 4 is the same thing as 2. And that is going to be my final answer. Now, notice that 2, it's not going to divide into anything in the numerator because the numerator, everything is inside of that radical. Nothing goes into it that was rational. So that 2 in the denominator, it's just the 2 in the denominator. Notice another benefit of splitting the radical up the way we did. We know we end up with a lot of problems where we have to rationalize the denominator. Well, here we don't have any irrational numbers in the denominator, so we can leave our answer the way it is. Well, is this correct? We determined approximately what sine of 157.5 degrees is, about 0 0.3827, something like that, okay, based on what we have in the calculator. Let's verify that this has the same value. So we have the square root of 2 minus, and then the other square root is underneath, so a radical inside of a radical. Now when you keep typing, make sure you type after you've gotten out of that radical. So that whole expression is being divided by 2. And we evaluate that and sure enough it is the same value. So that is going to be the sine of 157.5 degrees. Okay, let's try another one. Let's try a cosine. So cosine of 3 pi over 8, okay, 3 pi over 8, not labeled on the unit circle. Maybe we could write it as a sum or difference of two angles, maybe we couldn't. Another option here is if we can take 3 pi over 8 and relate it to another angle that we know things about by merit of the fact that it is half of that angle, well then that's going to allow us to use a half angle formula. So 3 pi over 8, we want to know that is half of what angle? If we were to take an angle and divide it in half, it gives us 3 pi over 8. Well, what angle would that have to be? So solve for our unknown, our unknown angle, which means multiply the 2, move it over. So that's going to be 6 pi over 8, which is the same thing as 3 pi over 4. Well, 3 pi over 4, we know a lot about 3 pi over 4. We know that its sine is root 2 over 2. We know its cosine is negative root 2 over 2. So we know everything we need. So the cosine of 3 pi over 8 is going to be the same thing as the cosine of this angle that's then been cut in half. So it's the cosine of 3 pi over 4 if we were to take 3 pi over 4 and cut it in half. Now before we use the formula, let's go and verify what cosine of 3 pi over 8 is going to be. So the cosine of 3 pi over 8, let me change my mode real quick, radian mode, enter, okay, go back out, cosine of 3 pi over 8, and we know we're in radian mode, hey, we got the same value, okay, it's going to happen. You're going to see some repeated values, which means in theory we should get down to the expression we have above as our final answer since they do seem to match. So let's see what happens when we start to use our formula. So this is the angle that we're referencing. We're dividing that angle in two because that's equivalent to 3 pi over 8, the angle we're interested in. So our cosine half angle formula is going to be plus or minus, again we'll worry about that later, the square root of 1 plus the cosine of the angle that we're using divided by 2. So positive or negative square root of 1 plus the cosine of 3 pi over 4, all of that divided by 2, and that's all under the radical. Okay, plus or minus, is it plus or minus? Well, it's going to depend on what quadrant 3 pi over 8 is in. How can you determine what quadrant a radian measure is in? It's not as obvious as it is with degrees. 
focus on the coefficient for the pi, so that fraction, 3 over 8. What is 3 over 8 if we were to evaluate that and approximate it? So 3 over 8 is 0 0.375, so a little bit less than half. So here's my strategy here, here's what I'm doing. As I go around the unit circle, I start here and this is 0 pi's, this is half of a pi, this is a single pi, this is one and a half pies, and then I come full circle and I've got two pies. Three pi over eight is 0 0.375 pies, which means it's between zero pi and half of a pi, or 0 0.5 pi. So that means three pi over eight is gonna be somewhere in the first quadrant. Well, what do we know about angles in the first quadrant? Specifically, what do we know about the value of its cosine if it's an angle in the first quadrant? Well, since the cosine corresponds to the x value, we know the cosine is gonna have to be positive. So this square root is gonna have a positive value. And again, if it had been an angle in another quadrant where the cosine had a negative value, we would want the negative instead of the positive. So now that we know what that sign is, we can proceed and let's evaluate this cosine. So one plus the cosine of three pi over four, which is going to be, let's see, the cosine of three pi over four is going to be negative root two over two. All of that divided by two. Okay. We need to simplify this again, and it's a fraction inside of a fraction, so we can use the same strategy we used before. Now the only fraction on the inside has a denominator of two. We wanna get rid of that. So inside the radical, I'm gonna multiply on top and bottom by that two that I want to eliminate. So that's gonna be one, and then I'm gonna go ahead and write it as a subtraction, one minus root two over two, all of that is divided by two, and I'm gonna multiply on top and bottom by two. Just like before, I wanna put parentheses on the top so we make sure the two multiplies by both terms. So when I multiply it by that one, two times one is just gonna be two, and then two times root two over two, think of this as two over one, so root two over two, two over one, those twos cancel on the diagonal, and we're just left with root two. What about the denominator? Well, two times two, that's gonna give me four. Okay, just like before, we can kind of distribute that square root, we can split it up. So the square root of a quotient is the same thing as the quotient of two separate square roots. So that splits up with a square root of four in the denominator. And again, the benefit of that is now this, this becomes rational because root four is a perfect square. So two minus root two, square root in the numerator, and then two in the denominator. And we already evaluated this one. We know it's approximate value. And we know that that matches up to cosine of three pi over eight based on what we just did a moment ago. So that is gonna be the value of cosine of three pi over eight. Now, just like with the sum and difference formulas, you're gonna find a lot of answers that seem to repeat. Ultimately, that shouldn't be very surprising. If you think about everything that we do label on the unit circle, well, all of our functions are periodic. We have a lot of repeated values. We see lots of root twos over two, root threes over two. We see a lot of one halves. All of those repeat around the unit circle, possibly making positive negative or negative positive, depending on the quadrants as we transition from one to the other. But because we do see so many repeated things around the unit circle, it makes sense that we would see repeats once we use these special formulas as well. Okay, let's try one more. Let's try one with a tangent. So tangent of five pi over eight. Now again, we don't see five pi over eight labeled on the unit circle. Well, first off, what quadrant is that in? Five pi over eight. What is five over eight? Five over eight is 0 0.625. That's how many pies we have. So that's somewhere between half a pie and a whole pie. So somewhere in the second quadrant. 
Well, we know in the second quadrant, tangent is going to have a negative value. So 5 pi over 8, that's in quadrant 2. We know it's going to have a negative value. Okay. Well, 5 pi over 8, it may be in quadrant 2, but we certainly don't see it labeled. But maybe it is half of some angle that we do see labeled. What angle would it have to be to cut in half and then get 5 pi over 8? So if we solve for our unknown, again, multiply the 2, move it over. So that's going to be 10 pi over 8, which reduces to 5 pi over 4. So if we were to take 5 pi over 4, which we do have labeled, we do have information about that, and cut that in half, that is going to give us the, um, the 5 pi over 8 that we want. So the tangent of 5 pi over 8, we're going to think of that as the tangent of 5 pi over 4 that's been cut in half. Okay, now if you remember, we had a variety of options for tangent. We had three different formulas we can use for tangent. The first one is a formal formula, a formal formula that comes from combining the original sine and cosine ones, but it is not going to be the easiest formula to use, particularly from a simplification standpoint. So from a practical standpoint, when we want to evaluate the tangent of a half angle, Typically, we want to use either the second formula or the third formula, and both of those are pretty easy to simplify overall, so either one is going to be fine. The plus minus, just to be sure, it also only goes with the radical. So if you choose to use the second or the third form of the half angle formula, you don't have to worry about the plus or minus. The plus or minus only goes with the formula that has the radical. So let's use the second formula just because it's going to be a little bit more straightforward to use. So 1 minus the cosine of our angle that we're using, that we're referencing, divided by the sine of that angle. So in this case, the angle we're using is going to be 5 pi over 4. So it's going to be, double check my signs, 1 minus cosine over sine. So 1 minus the cosine of 5 pi over 4 divided by the sine of 5 pi over 4. Okay, and again we don't need the plus or minus because we're not using the formula that has a radical as part of it. Now we just need to evaluate these two and then simplify from there. So the cosine at 5 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4 is in the third quadrant, so the cosine is going to be negative. So that's going to be 1 minus root 2 over 2 minus, is it? 1 minus negative root 2 over 2 because the cosine is negative, so we're subtracting a negative, okay? Divided by the sine at 5 pi over 4, which is also negative root 2 over 2. Well, now we have two fractions inside of this one bigger fraction. We can use the same strategy we used before. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite that numerator with an addition, and then we can do that additional step. Okay, so we want to get rid of the denominators within the fraction. So find whatever's common. If we had two different denominators, we want to find the least common denominator for the pair. In this case, both of these have a denominator of two. So I'm gonna multiply on top and bottom by a two. So in the numerator, it has to distribute. In the denominator, we're just multiplying it by one value. Okay, so in my numerator, distribute the two when I distribute it to the second term, root 2 over 2 multiplied by 2 over 1 becomes just a square root of 2. And all of that is divided by whatever we get in the denominator. So multiply by negative root 2 over 2 times 2 over 1. So that's going to be negative square root of 2. Okay. This, unfortunately, is not rationalized, so we do need to rationalize this, and I do want to write it out. Sometimes you can do a rationalization in your head. Here, that's not necessarily the best idea. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom 
by that expression that I want to rationalize by that denominator. Now notice those double negatives, those will become a positive and then the negative will become part of the numerator. Okay, so in the numerator, we have two times negative root two, so negative two root two, and then positive and a negative multiplied gives me a negative. Root two times root two, well that's root two squared, which is just gonna be two. Then in the denominator, the two negatives make a positive. Root two times root two, root two squared, is just going to be 2. So the last thing I want to do, focusing on the rational parts, notice they all have a common factor of 2. So I'm going to factor that out in the numerator. If I factor it out from the first term, I'm just left with my radical and my negative. If I factor it out from the second term, well negative 2, factor out a 2, we're left with a negative 1. Then all of that is divided by 2. So our common factor reduces to 1, and we're left with negative root 2 minus 1. Let's check it. Now we didn't plug in the tangent at the very beginning, so let's do that. So the tangent of 5 pi over 8, okay, it's a negative number. What do we get when we take the negative square root of 2 minus one. Not surprisingly, again, we get the same value. They match up. That confirms our answer. Okay, so let's, let's look at a different kind of example. So that gives you a sense of how you might use those half angle formulas if you want to evaluate a trigonometric value for a given angle. But remember, we can use these in different ways as well. So we can also use these formulas when an angle is unknown, but maybe we have some information about one or more of its trigonometric values. So half angles are going to apply in either of these situations, either when the angle is known or when it's unknown. Our double angle formulas, which we haven't used yet, those are only going to apply, <coughs> excuse me, those are only going to apply when we're looking at angles that are unknown. Okay, now anytime the angle is unknown, immediate thought should be draw a right triangle, draw a coordinate plane, draw and label a right triangle, paying attention, of course, to the quadrant that you're in. Okay, so we've been given that the sine of our unknown angle theta is negative five over 13, and we've also been told that the cosine of this angle is less than zero. It has a negative value. This additional piece of information is gonna help us determine the quadrant. So what have we been told? Well, we've been told that the sine of theta is less than zero. And we've also been told that the cosine of theta is less than zero. So if the sine of theta is less than zero, sine is our y value, that means we're below the x-axis, so either quadrant three or quadrant four. If we know that the cosine is also negative, well, cosine is our x value, so that puts us on the left-hand side of the y-coordinate. So below the x-axis and to the left of the y-axis means we have to be in the third quadrant. So that means theta is gonna be some angle that takes us to the third quadrant. So let's label our triangle given our value for sine. So opposite over a hypotenuse. The opposite will be the negative. A hypotenuse always has a positive length. Okay, this is a Pythagorean triple. This is going to be negative 12. Make sure you pay close attention to the signs based on the quadrant we're in. Both legs are going to have a negative length based on the fact that we're in quadrant 3. Now once we have our triangle labeled, we can go find the values that we want. So the first thing we want is sine of double our angle. So if this is theta, imagine doubling that angle, which would take us from the third quadrant, double it, rotate it around a little bit more. What would be the sine if we got to that particular location? Well, we can't double these values. It doesn't work that way. Sine of double our angle means we have to use the sine double angle formula. So the sine of double some angle is gonna be two times the sine of the angle that we doubled times the cosine of the angle that we doubled. 
And I'm gonna go ahead and write in that formula since we haven't used this one yet. So two times the sine of theta times the cosine of theta. And these two values can be determined based on the fact that we have this triangle fully labeled. So that's gonna be two times the sine of theta, so opposite over hypotenuse, negative five over 13, times the cosine of theta, the adjacent over hypotenuse, so negative 12 over 13. The calculator is a pretty good time saver here, so if you just wanna type all of that into the calculator, you can do that. So two times negative five over 13, times negative 12 over 13. Okay, and that's gonna give us a decimal, but we can convert it to a fraction using math arrow frac, and that's gonna give us the fractional form. So 120 over 169. And notice I didn't really worry too much about parentheses in this situation. If we're not talking about multiplication and division combined with addition and subtraction, the order we do the multiplication and the division in doesn't really matter. Your calculator understands what it needs to do and it just does it left to right. Okay, so that is going to be the value for our sine. Notice it has a positive value. What about our cosine? Well, again, we need a formula that will take the cosine of double the angle that we were already given. This is a unique situation because we actually have three different options here to evaluate the cosine of our double angle. It doesn't matter which one you pick. Each one is pretty much the same in terms of the difficulty or the ease of use. I typically just use the first one because it's the first one. So cosine squared of our angle minus sine squared of our angle. And again, we can pull those values off of our triangle. I'm gonna put parentheses around the cosine and the sine so that when we square it, it's gonna take care of those negatives for us. So our cosine, our adjacent over hypotenuse, so negative 12 over 13, and we're squaring that, minus the sine squared, so opposite over hypotenuse, negative five over 13, and that's also being squared. This is another time where your calculator will come in handy. Okay, so plug it in, but make sure you put parentheses around those values that you're squaring, specifically because those values are negative. That's gonna be really important here. We also have to make sure that we're squaring both the numerator and the denominator. So the parentheses, they're gonna take care of that for us. So minus negative five over 12, and that is also squared. So it's gonna square each of the fractions and then it's gonna subtract the result. Okay, let's see. Can we convert that to a fraction? Nope, that doesn't look right. Something got typed wrong here. So let's do it one step at a time. So negative 12 over 13 squared. I'm not sure what my calculator did. I probably typed something wrong. So negative 12 over 13 and we're squaring it convert it to a fraction, so 144 over 169. We can do this in a couple of steps, not a big deal. So 144 over 169, so negative five, parentheses, make sure you put parentheses, negative five over 13 squared. Okay, so that's gonna be that, convert it to a fraction, so math, arrow, frac, 25 over 169, so minus 25 over 169. Notice we already have the common denominator, so all we have to do is subtract the numerators, so 144 minus 25 is gonna be 119 over that common denominator of 169. And that is gonna be the value of the cosine of double our angle. Now, what about the tangent? We do have a formula for tangent, but as it turns out, we don't need it here. Why don't we need it? Well, the tangent of any angle is going to be the sine of that angle divided by the cosine of that angle. 
and in this case we already have the values for the sine and the cosine. So if we just use those values that we've already calculated, that's going to be a pretty major time saver. So our sine is going to be 120 over 169, and then our cosine is going to be 119 over 169. Now we have a matching denominator for each of these fractions inside of the expression and that'll cancel, but just to verify that they do, remember when we're dividing fractions, we're going to keep the numerator as is, so 120 over 169, convert from division to multiplication, and then take the reciprocal of the denominator, so 119 over 169 becomes 169 over 119. And so we can see we've got a common numerator and denominator that's going to reduce to 1, which means we have 120 over 119, and that is our value for tangent. So much quicker than having to use a formula, but keep in mind, again, you could use the formula. It would take a little while to simplify, but you would get down to the same answer. Now again, we don't really have a good option for checking these answers because we don't know exactly what theta is. All we know is the triangle we drew. So technically we could check using maybe the inverse sign, um, making some adjustments based on the quadrant we're in, but it's probably more work than it's worth. Okay, now the sine of the half angle. So if we were to take theta and cut it in half, what would the sine be? That's the next thing we want to find. Okay, so we need first our formula. So our sine half angle formula plus or minus the square root of one minus the cosine of our angle, in this case it's theta instead of alpha, divided by two. So plus or minus the square root of one minus the cosine of theta divided by two. Now plus or minus, what do we do about that here? We need to determine which one it is. Is it positive, is it negative? It can't be both. Well again, that's gonna depend on the quadrant, but we've gotta be careful here. Our angle that we started with is in quadrant three. That is not the angle, that um, quadrant, excuse me, that our half angle is in. We have to take into account what would happen if we take an angle in the third quadrant and cut it in half. Now we don't know exactly what theta is. All that we know is that it's in the third quadrant, but that does tell us that it has to be somewhere between 180 degrees and 270 degrees. So we know that 180 degrees is gonna be less than theta, but at the same time, theta is also going to be less than 270 degrees, just because of that quadrant we're in. That means theta over two would result when we take each of those boundaries and cut those in half. So 180 over two is gonna give us 90 degrees. And then 270 over two, was that 135? 135 degrees. What quadrant is represented there? Well, between 90 and 135, that means quadrant two. So if we were to take this angle that's in the third quadrant and then cut it in half, the half angle is gonna be an angle that's in the second quadrant. So in terms of determining the signs, positive or negative, we base it on the fact that the half angle, the angle we're evaluating this trig function for, is an angle in quadrant two. So picture quadrant two. We've got our half angle somewhere in quadrant two. Our sign, is it gonna be positive or negative? Well, since sine corresponds to our y value, our y values are positive in this quadrant. So we know we're going to want the positive version of our radical. So now that we've taken care of that, we can sub in our values. So square root of one minus the cosine of theta, so the cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, so minus negative 12 over 13, and then all of that is divided by two. Okay, we've used the strategy a couple times now for simplifying the complex fraction. So the fraction on the inside has a denominator of 13. So if we multiply on top and bottom inside the radical by that 13, then that will 
clean up the fractions for us. So one plus 12 over 13, all of that's divided by two, and we're gonna multiply on the top and bottom by 13. So make sure that we distribute in that numerator. Okay, so one times 13 is gonna be 13. 12 over 13 times 13 is just gonna be 12. And then in the denominator, two times 13 is going to be 26. Okay, so if we simplify our numerator, that's gonna be the square root of 25 over 26. Okay, now we have that rule for radicals again that says we can split up the square root of a quotient into the quotient of two square roots. So that's gonna be the square root of 25 over the square root of 26. The square root of 25, that simplifies to five. So five over root 26. Now we're not quite done. We know we can't leave it like this because this is not rationalized. So we wanna get rid of that radical in the denominator. So multiply in the numerator and the denominator by root 26, which would give us five root 26 over 26. And that will be our rationalized version. Okay, so let's do the same thing, but let's do it for cosine. If this is our angle and we wanna know cosine of the half angle, what would that be? Well, remember it's the same formula, except we have an addition instead of a subtraction. So plus or minus, we have to make the determination of the sign separately since we're talking about a different trig function. So positive or negative, one plus the cosine of theta divided by two. Okay, so let's think about the sign. Now we determined that our half angle would be between 90 and 135 degrees. In other words, in quadrant two. Well, what do we know about angles in quadrant two in terms of their cosine? Well, cosine corresponds to our x coordinate. And in quadrant two, all of our x coordinates are gonna be negative, which means in this case, we're going to keep the negative version of our radical. So this is the first example we've seen where we've done that. Here, because of the quadrant, we want the negative version instead of the positive. So we've made that determination. Now let's plug in our numbers. So one plus the cosine of theta. The cosine is negative 12 over 13. So plus negative 12 over 13. All of that divided by two. Okay, same strategy as before. We wanna get rid of that fraction inside of the fraction. So multiply in the numerator and denominator under the radical by the 13 that we want to get rid of. And notice I went ahead and took the positive and negative and wrote it as a subtraction. We're multiplying by 13 over 13. Distribute the 13 in the numerator and don't forget that negative out front. Make sure that continues as you continue simplifying. So 13 times one is gonna be 13. And then 13 times 12 over 13, well the 13's reduce, they divide out, give you one. So we're just left with the 12 that was in the numerator. And then our denominator two times 13 is gonna give us 26. So notice we ended up with the same denominator we had above. Again, not a coincidence. We're gonna see a lot of that happening. So negative square root of 13 minus 12, which is one, over 26. Okay, split it up, numerator and denominator separately. The square root of one is just one. So negative, one over the square root of 26. Rationalize it, get rid of that radical in the denominator. So that's gonna be negative square root of 26 over 26. And there is our cosine. And then last but not least, let's do the tangent. So again, we have tangent formulas. We have three of them in this case, three tangent half angle formulas. But just like we did with the double angle, if we know the sine and the cosine for the angle in question, we can just take the ratio of those two 
And then that's a shortcut for finding our tangent value and it's a great time saver. So sine of our angle, cosine of our angle, divide them and we get the tangent of our angle. So sine is gonna be five root 26 over 26 and then cosine negative root 26 over 26. Now you can probably guess a lot of these common things are going to simplify, but just to verify that they do and to show how they simplify, convert your division to a multiplication. So fraction in the numerator stays as is. So 5 root 26 over 26. We convert from division to multiplication and we multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. Now that's not going to flip the sign. It's just going to flip the numerator and the denominator. Okay, but that shows us how things reduce here. So we have a common 26. We also have a common root 26. So look at everything that's gone at that point. What are we left with? Well, we have a five in the numerator. We have a negative, negative nothing, so negative one. So that's just going to be negative five. That will be the value for our tangent. Okay, so again, major time saver. This shows you how you can use your formulas, but use them when the angle is unknown. So the half angle formulas, they work when your angle is known, when it's something you can identify on the unit circle, or when it's unknown, but maybe you have information about one or more of its trig values and then the double angle formulas that we used above. We're gonna use those exclusively in these situations for angles that are unknown, because if we take an angle that's on the unit circle and double it, well, we get another angle that's already labeled on the unit circle, so using a formula there just doesn't make sense. Now, let's do a few verifications using these identities. Just like the sum and difference identities can be used to verify some additional identities, um, our double angle and our half angle formulas can be used in a similar way. Now I'm going to use a different strategy than I normally use for this first verification. Normally we start with the more complicated side, which here would be the right hand side. But I look at the right hand side and nothing immediately stands out that I can do except maybe to factor out a cosine. But if I factor out a cosine, I'm just left with a cosine squared minus a three. So four cosine squared minus three. Well, I'm not really sure where I could go from there in order to get to something that looks like this. So in this case, I'm gonna start with the less complicated side only because I see the cosine of some multiple of an angle and I know I have some techniques to deal with the multiple of an angle. Now we've gotta be very careful here though. This is not cosine of a double angle, which would be two X. This is cosine of three X. And I don't have a triple angle formula, but here's what I can do. I can take that and I can write that three X as X plus two X. Why does that help? Well, we have a formula it allows us to take the cosine of two things that are added. So let's see if that helps us out here. So remember, if we take the cosine of a sum, it's going to be the cosine of each of them. So cosine x, cosine two x, and then when it's a sum of angles, the formula is gonna involve subtraction. So minus the sine x times the sine of two x. Okay, so by the end, cosine 2x, sine x, and sine of 2x have to be gone. They should be gone by the time we get to the very end. Okay, so how are we gonna get rid of them? Well, cosine x is gonna stay. Cosine of 2x and sine of 2x, we have identities that allow us to get rid of those. Now, cosine of 2x, remember there's three forms of the formula for cosine of 2x which one are you gonna use here? Well, more than likely, that's gonna take some trial and error. All three may be beneficial. You may get to a final answer to the final answer you want by using any three of them. 
it's not necessarily a guarantee. You may use one versus another and find that just nothing seems to be working out, which means you go back and you try a different form of it. It turns out that in a lot of these verification type problems, for whatever reason, the first form tends to be the one that works out best for us. So the first cosine double angle formula is cosine squared of theta minus sine squared of theta. Now immediately you might look at this and think, well, we don't want these sine squareds at the end, right? We wanna get just in terms of cosine, so maybe your instinct is to use the last formula, which is you know, a reasonable assessment, but the only problem is that notice over here, we're gonna have some signs and we've gotta be able to get rid of those signs. So not only do we want some cosines at the end, but we need something here in the middle that's going to allow us to cancel out the signs that we don't want. So by using the identity that has both a cosine and a sine, we'll get part of what we want for the final answer, and we'll have something else that may help us to get rid of the things that we don't want. So I'm gonna use the first version of that cosine double angle identity. And again, it's gonna be some trial and error in a lot of cases. If you try an identity and it doesn't work, that's okay. Go back to the point where you did that substitution and maybe try a different form of the identity. It's okay, it does take some trial and error. Now the sine double angle, there's only one formula for that, so that's good news. So minus sine x times sine x cosine x. That's the only form for that double angle identity. Let's just verify that. There we go. Sine double angle to sine of the angle cosine of the angle. Okay. So now we need to distribute over here and then these are just factors being multiplied together. There's no addition or subtraction here. There's no real distribution but notice we have a sine x and another sine x so we could write that as a sine squared. So when we distribute our cosine, cosine times cosine squared is gonna give us cosine cubed, and then cosine times sine squared, where one of them is negative, it's gonna be minus cosine x sine squared x. Okay, the next term is subtracted, so minus sine x times two times sine x times cosine x. So minus two times sine squared x times cosine x. Okay, so where are we now? Well, we've got a cosine cubed. Okay, so one of those, we've got one of them, we should have four of them, so we're not quite there, but this is gonna stay. Cosine and cosine, Okay, we've got some cosines. The sine squared, that needs to go away. That's a problem. Well, how do we get rid of a sine squared if we want everything in terms of cosine? Well, remember, we have the Pythagorean identities. So let me write down our first Pythagorean identity. Sine squared of an angle plus cosine squared of an angle is equal to one. So if we want something to substitute in place of sine squared, rearrange this identity. If we isolate sine squared, we can do so by moving over our cosine squared, subtracting it on both sides, and that'll give us something to substitute in place of these two functions that we know are not present in our final answer. So the cosine cubed, do we wanna keep that? We do have cosine cubed in our final answer that we're looking for. We wanna keep the cosine x, but that sine squared, we're gonna substitute a one minus cosine squared. And make sure you write it in terms of x. We're not talking theta. Theta is part of the formula, but here we're talking about x specifically. Now I need to do the same thing again over here where I have a sine squared. I'm gonna make that same substitution. So one minus cosine squared x times cosine x. Now just to show you where we are structurally, this is a term. This is one big term, and this is another big term. So we need to simplify each of those two larger terms. Now here in the first one, the first one we wanna simplify, we're gonna to have to distribute. 
I would go ahead and distribute the negative as well, so we don't have to take another step to do that, but you want to go very slowly, you want to be very methodical. So negative cosine times 1 is going to be negative cosine, so minus cosine x. Negative cosine times negative cosine squared. We'll check your signs first. Negative times negative is going to be a positive. And then cosine times cosine squared, that's going to be cosine cubed. So cosine cubed x. Okay, so that takes care of this term and this term. This one's a little more complicated because notice we're distributing in two directions. The negative 2 has to distribute, but the cosine does as well. So if it helps, you might want to rearrange this. So we could also write this as negative 2 and then write the cosine x next to that and then write everything that's in parentheses. So that's just a rearrangement. I haven't changed anything, I've just rearranged it. But it may help us when we do the distribution. So negative 2 cosine x times 1 is just, I'm going to write it down below, it's just negative 2 cosine x. Negative 2 cosine x times negative cosine squared. Okay, so go one at a time. So negative times negative is going to be a positive. We have a coefficient of 2. And then a cosine times a cosine squared is going to be a cosine cubed. So cosine cubed x. Well, we're in a pretty good position, right? We've got most of what we want. We want cosine cubed. We've got some terms with cosine cubed. We want a cosine to the first power. We've got some terms with that. So now all we need to do is combine our like terms. So it might help to underline things that match. So those terms are going to be like terms. And then these terms are going to be like terms as well. So cosine cubed plus another cosine cubed plus two additional cosines cubed. So that's going to be four in total. So four cosine cubed x and then negative cosine x, watch your signs, minus an additional two cosines of x. So that's going to be negative three cosine x and that gives us the final answer that we want so that identity is verified. Okay, let's try another one. We want to verify that the cosine to the fourth power of x minus the sine to the fourth power of x is equal to cosine to x. Okay, now, left hand side, right hand side, what do we do here? Well, I know I have some identities I can use to replace cosine 2x with something else not related to a double angle. So what are my options there if I wanted to start with the right hand side? So cosine of a double angle, it could be cosine squared minus sine squared, 1 minus 2 sine squared, 2 cosine squared minus 1. Well, I want both a cosine and a sine, so the first option might be better. Here's the only problem though. If I do the direct substitution right here, I get a cosine squared minus a sine squared, but I want a fourth power and then another fourth power. So I would end up with two exponents of two, but how do I get to the two exponents of four? That means I'd have to suddenly add in some stuff that's not already there, which is fairly complicated to do. So even though I have some identities that might work over here, it may be better to start with this side, just based on our basic analysis here that shows that we'd have to go from exponents of two to exponents of four, which is potentially problematic. So I'm gonna start with the left-hand side in this case. So cosine to the fourth power of x minus sine to the fourth power of x. Now I don't really have anything I can substitute in place of these. I mean, maybe I could write this as cosine squared squared. This would be sine squared squared. We could substitute with a Pythagorean identity, but the goal is to get down to this, okay? One strategy we can use, particularly when we have higher exponents, is factoring. So how could something like this factor? Well, we have something to the fourth power minus something else to the fourth power. Now, as I just mentioned, we can think of each of those as being something squared that's then squared again. 
which means we have a term squared minus another term squared. Well, a perfect square minus another perfect square factors as a difference of squares. It factors as our first term plus our second term times our first term minus our second term, whatever they happen to be. In this case, they happen to be something squared and then something else squared. So this would factor as a squared plus b squared times a squared minus b squared. So it is a difference of squares, but the thing being squared is already squared. That's how we get a fourth power. So if we can rewrite these using this as a model, this is the same thing as cosine squared x that's then squared minus sine squared of x, which is also then squared. So using this as the model, again, we have a perfect square minus another perfect square. So it's gonna be our two terms added, and then our two terms subtracted, and we multiply those factors together. So that's gonna be cosine squared x plus sine squared x times cosine squared x minus sine squared x. Now, do not redistribute these. If you redistribute them, you get right back to where you started. You completely reverse everything you just accomplished. But look at each of these factors. So the first pair, what do you notice about the first pair? Well, cosine squared plus sine squared, we actually wrote something about that above. Cosine squared plus sine squared evaluates to one. So all of this just simplifies down to one. What about this though? Well, I look at that and I'm like, well, we just looked at that a moment ago, right? Where did we look at that? We looked at that as being one of the forms of our cosine double angle formula. So the cosine of a double angle is the same thing as the cosine squared of that angle minus the sine squared of that angle. And that's exactly what we have right here. We have the cosine squared of our angle minus the sine squared of our angle. And so we know that's the same thing as the cosine of the double angle. And so one times anything is just that value. So that's going to be cosine of 2x, which again is what we wanted. Okay. Let's try one additional verification. We haven't done one with a half angle. So let's do one with a half angle. So we wanna verify that the tangent of a half angle plus the cotangent of the same half angle is equal to two times the cosecant of x. Okay, so cosecant. I know cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So having a denominator of sine might be a good thing. So let's see what our options are for tangent of a half angle and cotangent of a half angle. So I'm definitely going to start with the left hand side in this case. So tangent of x over 2 plus cotangent of x over 2. We're going to work with that side. So let's go look at our options for half angle. Well, We don't have a cotangent formula, but remember cotangent is just the reciprocal of tangent. So whatever we do with tangent, we just flip it and we've got something for cotangent. We have three options for a tangent formula. We've got one that has a radical and then two that don't. Now remember by the end, we wanna get down to a cosecant. And we know cosecant could come from something that has sine as its denominator. Well, look at this second formula we have for the tangent half angle. Notice it has a sine in the denominator. So in absence of any other strategies, that potentially gives us an indication that that's a good place to start. So for our tangent half angle, let's substitute in one minus cosine over sine. So tangent of x over two is gonna be one minus the cosine of our original angle divided by the sine of our original angle. So what's cotangent? Well, if this is the formula for tangent, tangent and cotangent are reciprocals. So if we wanted a formula for cotangent, well, just flip this and take the reciprocal. 
So that's going to be sine x in the numerator divided by 1 minus cosine x in the denominator. Okay, well, we know our final answer doesn't have fractions and it only has one term, which means we need to get rid of the fractions and we need to also combine everything so that it's one term. So I would probably start here by combining these two rational expressions together. Now, in order to do that, we need a common denominator. So that's gonna be a good place to start. So our common denominator is gonna require both of these. We're gonna need both a sine and a one minus cosine x. So let's write out what that's gonna look like. So for my first ratio, I'm missing the one minus cosine x. So I'm gonna to have to multiply on top and bottom by the one minus cosine x. So on my numerator, I already have a one minus cosine x. I'm gonna need another one. in order to get my common denominator. Okay, now in my second ratio, I've got the one minus cosine x, I'm missing the sine. So I'm gonna have to multiply top and bottom by the sine that I'm missing. Well, there's already a sine x there. I'm gonna multiply by another one. Again, using that strategy to get the common denominator and I can write all of that now over my common denominator of sine x times one minus cosine x. So let's clean up what we have in the numerator. This needs to be foiled. Here it's just sine times sine. So don't overthink that part, it's just a sine squared. So first, outer, inner, last. My first pair, one times one is one. Now my outer pair is negative cosine my inner pair is also a negative cosine. Be careful, they don't cancel out. They have the same sign, so they combine. So a negative and then another negative. It's gonna give me two negatives in total. So minus two cosine x. And then my last pair, negative cosine times negative cosine is going to be positive cosine squared. And then over here, I have a sine squared, so plus sine squared x. And then I'm gonna leave the denominator in a factored form. Why do I wanna do that? Well, as we determined at the very beginning, ideally to get to a cosecant, we may end up with something that has a denominator of sine. Well, we've got a denominator of sine, but we've got some other stuff as well. And it would be nice to be able to cancel out that one minus cosine x at some point. But if I redistribute, I'm gonna put it in a form where I can't cancel that out. So until I know otherwise, I'm just gonna leave that in the factored form. Well, what else can I do? Let's focus on the numerator. Again, I see that cosine squared plus sine squared, and I know that combines to one. That combines and gives me a one, just based on that Pythagorean identity. Well, if that then just is replaced with a one, what can I also do? Well, we have a positive one, and now we're adding on another positive one, which is gonna give us a positive two, and then we've still got that negative two cosine x divided by our denominator, sine x times one minus cosine x. Look at the numerator again. What else can we do? Remember, we wanna keep this sign in the denominator in order to get a cosecant at the end, but ideally, the one minus cosine needs to go away. Well, notice in the numerator, both of these terms have a common factor of two. We could factor out the two. What would that leave us with? That would leave us with a one minus a cosine x, which matches the one in the denominator. So if I factor out that two in the numerator, I'm left with one minus cosine x. And then again in our denominator, we have sine x times one minus cosine x. And now that common factor divides and reduces to one. We're left with two over sine x. Well, forget about the two. If you just had a one in the numerator, one over sine x is a cosecant. So we have two cosecant x.
and that was what we wanted at the very end, so our identity is verified. So let's look at one additional set of identities. This is a different set. It's used for a different purpose. It's not used to evaluate trig functions. It's used purely from a simplification standpoint. So by manipulating two of the double angle formulas, I want you to focus on the double angle formulas specifically for cosine. Remember we had three of them. By manipulating two of them, and I'll show you which ones in just a minute, we can do something else. We can reduce even powers, in other words, two, four, six as exponents, even powers of sine and cosine. This is going to be a skill you use in calculus. In order to take an expression that has exponents, a trigonometric expression that has exponents, we can manipulate a couple of our identities and we can get rid of the exponents and replace them with something else. Now it's important by doing this you're going to introduce double angles even if they weren't already there to start with. So if you start with exponents and get rid of the exponents, it's going to introduce double angles. In other words, you cannot get rid of both multiples and exponents. You choose one or the other. But based on the strategy that you have once you use this skill in calculus, it's going to be more important to get rid of exponents than it is to get rid of a coefficient for an angle inside of a trig function. So here are the identities. So sine squared, if we want to reduce that exponent of 2 and get rid of it, another way of writing sine squared is as 1 minus cosine of 2 theta divided by 2. And cosine squared, if we want to get rid of the exponent, it can be written as 1 plus cosine of 2 theta divided by 2. So you end up with an expression that no longer has any exponents in it. And if you were to take the ratio of these two, you end up with a formula for tangent. Now I want to show you where these come from for at least one of them. So let's flip back over and look at the double angle formulas for cosine. Remember there are three of them. These last two are the ones that we can use to find our double angle, or excuse me, our power reducing identities. So let's look at the first one. So 1 minus 2 sine squared of theta. So cosine of 2 theta can be written as 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. And remember, where did that come from? That just comes from taking the original double angle formula substituting in place of cosine squared using the Pythagorean identity and then just simplifying from there. So it's really just the original formula that's been slightly manipulated and then the third one is the same kind of thing if we replace the sine squared. So what I want you to imagine doing is imagine taking this and suppose we wanted to take this identity and isolate sine squared. So solve for another term in this identity. Well, how would you do that? You'd have to start by subtracting 1. So that would be cosine of 2 theta minus 1. And that's equal to, careful, negative 2 sine squared of theta. We still have that negative. And so then you could isolate your sine squared in one additional step. If you divided everything by negative 2, that would isolate your sine squared. So sine squared of theta is equal to this expression. Now typically we don't like to use a negative in a denominator. If we distribute that negative to both terms in the numerator, it'll take this positive term and make it negative, and it'll take this negative term and make it positive. So we could rewrite that as positive 1, and then distribute the negative here, so that'll give us a negative cosine 2 theta, and then that's divided by and there's our identity right there. So if we have a double angle, we can evaluate the double angle by using a formula that involves an exponent. 
if instead the goal is to get rid of the exponent, to replace something that has an exponent with something that doesn't, we reverse this identity, we write it in a different form, and in place of this exponent, we end up with an expression that has a double angle. So again, this shows you why you can't get rid of both a multiple and an exponent. To deal with the multiple, you introduce the exponent. Well, to deal with the exponent, you introduce the multiple. So it's gonna be one or the other. But again, for what you're gonna use this for in calculus, it's gonna be more important to get rid of the exponents than it is to be able to deal with a double angle, a triple angle, something like that. So these identities, again, are not gonna be used in conjunction with the unit circle. They're strictly used to take more complicated expressions and simplify them down, specifically get rid of exponents. So let's do an example where we use one of these power reducing identities. Now, fair warning, these are fairly tedious. They are involved. Take a whole sheet of paper and plan to use a whole sheet of paper to do this kind of problem. But they are very formulaic in terms of once you do one, you pretty much follow the same procedure for all of them but you do have to be neat, you have to show your work, you have to be very organized. Okay, so we want to write cosine to the fourth power of 2x, I'll put that in parentheses just for clarity, in terms of the first power of cosine. Translate this as I wanna get rid of the exponent. By the very end, I wanna have just the first power of cosine, no exponents. Now why does it just say cosine instead of mentioning sine? Why doesn't it say first power of sine or cosine? Well look at our formulas. All three of our formulas are directly related to cosine of two theta because remember these formulas came from the cosine double angle identities. So when you do the power reduction, your final answer is only going to involve cosines. It's not going to involve any other trig functions. So that's why um, the problem is phrased the way it is. Okay, so let's go back and look at this. So we want to write in terms of the first power of cosine. Well, we don't have a cosine squared. We have a cosine to the fourth power. So one way to deal with this, probably the easiest way to deal with this, is rather than thinking of this as a cosine squared times another cosine squared, another way to think of this is if we were to take the cosine squared of 2x and then square that, that's going to be the same thing as cosine to the fourth power. So anything squared that is then squared again results in a fourth power. Now notice here we already have a double angle, so we're going to have to be careful. We're doubling from where we started, so if we double 2x, 2x doubled then becomes 4x, so just be aware of that. So here, here's where we're going to use our identity, our power reducing identity. So cosine squared of 2x, what is that? Let's flip over and find the formula. So cosine squared of whatever angle we have is going to be one plus the cosine of double that angle, whatever that angle was. So one plus cosine of double that angle divided by so I'm going to write this down to the side. So 1 plus cosine of double our angle, whatever that angle happens to be, divided by 2. Okay, well let's apply this to our actual expression. So we want to replace cosine squared of 2x with something that doesn't have an exponent using this expression. So cosine squared simplifies using this form. So we're going to replace that with one plus cosine of double our angle. So be careful here. Cosine of double our original angle. So if we double 2x, that's gonna give us 4x. That's our double angle there. And then all of that is divided by two. And then that is squared. Well, it almost looks like we're done, but think about what we really have. We have an expression that's squared and we're not gonna leave it in a form like that. What does this really mean? Well, we can square the numerator and the denominator separately. In the numerator, that means we're taking one plus 
cosine of 4x and squaring it means we're multiplying it by itself. So that's the same thing as multiplying that binomial by itself. And then in the denominator, we square the two and we get a four. So in the numerator, I need to FOIL this out. So one times one is gonna be one. My outer is cosine 4x and my inner is another cosine 4x. They're both positive terms, so they add together and I have two cosines of 4x. And then my last pair, cosine of 4x times cosine of 4x, be careful here. The 4x's are inside the cosine, so for clarity's sake, I want to put parentheses here. We're squaring the cosine. 4x is not multiplied by 4x. Cosine of 4x is one whole unit. You multiply it by itself and you end up with that whole unit squared. So plus cosine squared of 4x. And again, if you want to put parentheses just for the sake of clarity, you can do that. And then all of that is divided by four. So why are we not actually done? Well, look, we have another exponent on cosine. We want everything in the very end in terms of the first power of cosine. So this one's okay. This is cosine with an exponent of one. This one's not. So we're going to have to replace this expression using my cosine double angle formula again. Now before I do that, I'll show you why this is gonna matter in a minute. I'm gonna go ahead and factor out the denominator. So a denominator of four, division by four, is the same thing as multiplication by one fourth. So I'm gonna pull out that one fourth so that I no longer have a denominator associated with this numerator. So that's one plus two times the cosine of 4x plus the cosine squared of 4x. So these two expressions, they're equivalent. All I did is factor out that division by 4, which means factoring out multiplication by 1 fourth. Okay, this, this is what we want to work with now. So I'm going to go over to the side and we're just going to work with that one expression. That is what we need to reduce, again, using this power reducing identity. So cosine squared of 4x, okay, we're using the same identity because it's still a power of cosine. So cosine squared of 4x is going to be 1 plus cosine of double our angle. Well, if we're starting with an angle of 4x and we double it, that's going to be cosine of 8x. And then all of that is divided by two. That can then substitute in place of our expression that has an exponent. So one fourth times one plus two cosine four x plus all of this. So one plus cosine eight x, because we doubled that four x to get rid of that exponent and all of that's divided by two. Here's why I factored out that one fourth. If I hadn't done so, at this moment, I would then have all of this as a numerator over four as a denominator, which looks more complicated than it needs to. So by factoring out that one fourth before I did this substitution, it looks a little bit less overwhelming at this point in the problem. So uh, for all intents and purposes, we've accomplished the goal. The goal was to write everything in terms of the first power of cosine, but this is not really an appropriate final answer. We need to clean it up. Anything that can be combined should be combined, and then we should go from there. So one thing I could do at this moment is maybe just go ahead and distribute the 1 fourth. That's okay if we want to do that. So I'm going to distribute the 1 fourth to each of these terms. And keep in mind when I distribute it here, I'm multiplying it by that whole term. So 1 fourth times 1 is going to be 1 fourth. 1 fourth times 2 times cosine of 4x. Well, forget about the cosine of 4x. I'm just multiplying by the 2. So 1 fourth times 2 is going to be 1 half. Now, just to be sure, 
what does not happen? You do not distribute the 1 fourth into the cosine. Whatever's inside of the cosine is inside of the cosine. Things don't go in. Sort of like if you had a square root of 4x, for instance. If you had a 1 fourth out front, you cannot distribute that 1 fourth into the radical. It doesn't work that way. You can't do anything like that. Same kind of thing here. Think of that 4x as being something under a radical. It's kind of like that. Nothing goes into it. It stays separate because it is the input for a function. So when we're distributing a coefficient, we're only combining it with other coefficients, other things that are outside of our trig function. Okay. Now when we distribute over here, let's be careful. So we have a 1 half. So 1 fourth times 1 half would be 1 eighth. And then what else do we have? We have a cosine 8x also divided by 2. So think of that as also having a 1 half in front of it. 1 fourth times that 1 half over there also gives us a 1 eighth. So plus 1 eighth times the cosine of 8x. So what does combine and what doesn't combine? Well, anything that's purely a constant that can combine. Do these other two terms combine? Well, this is a cosine of 4x and this is a cosine of 8x. They are not like terms. Just like a square root of 4x and a square root of 8x, they have some similarities, but they're not like terms. The same kind of thing is going on here. So those other two terms, they are different. They are not like terms. The only things that combine in this case are going to be our two um, constants. So if you want, I'm going to go out to the side and I'm going to do that combination out to the side, get that common denominator. So we can write 1 fourth as 2 over 8. So 2 over 8 plus 1 over 8, that's going to give us 3 over 8, which does not reduce. And so our final answer, just combining what we can, we have a constant of 3 eighths plus one half times the cosine of 4x plus one eighth times the cosine of 8x. And that's going to be our final answer, fully simplified. Now you may look at that and think that is not simpler than what we started with. And in some ways, you're right. But again, you have to think about the goal. The goal was to get rid of the exponents. And once you get to calculus, it'll make more sense why you need to do that. There will be certain problems you want to work that are easier to work when they're in this form than when they're in a form with an exponent. So being able to get rid of that exponent is going to be an important skill. It's going to save you a lot of work in order to take something like this and through all of this convert it to something that doesn't have exponents. So it is a lot of work to do in the meantime, but writing something in a form like this will allow you to work certain problems that you actually cannot solve when your expression is in this form. So it will be helpful regardless of how time consuming and tedious it is, it will be helpful once you get to calculus. So that caps off our list of identities. So just to give you a sense of all the different identities you have. We have reciprocal and quotient identities. So anytime we relate cosecant to one over sine, we're using a reciprocal identity. Anytime we write tangent as sine over cosine, we're using a quotient identity. So we use those pretty frequently. We use Pythagorean identities. So sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. That's the fundamental one. We've used that a lot. We used it several times here in this one video. Um, what else do we have? We have even odd identities. We also have our sum and difference identities that we introduced in the last video. So we can take the sine of a sum, the sine of a difference, cosine tangent of a sum and difference as well. So those can be used um, in the context of the unit circle when we have some actual angles, known or unknown. They can also be used to verify identities. And then here in this video, we've introduced our double angle identities, our half angle identities, and then our power reducing identities. So power reducing, what we just used here, very specific to this kind of problem. It's just used to simplify expressions. Double angle and half angle identities are a little bit more versatile. So our double angle identities, as we talked about before, those are used exclusively in situations where our angle is unknown. 
but maybe we have um, information about one or more of its trig values. Half angle identities can be used in a variety of situations when our angle is known or when it's unknown. So using the, these identities, having these as sort of a toolkit, it's going to be very helpful. It's going to allow you to deal with a lot of different trigonometric situations that you weren't previously equipped to deal with.